。老早，就是 Hello everybody, Good morning， 大家早安。那等下的议程是那个 OpenStreetMap X Wiki Data 的那个呃社群议程轨。不过呢，在这之前的话是。呃、uh, ，Cost Cup 第二天的 Prime Session 的那个，就是 Brandon 的 Map 的那个的部分。And I will start、uh, speaking in English because our speaker will、uh, present in English. And but he is fluent in Mandarin. I'm the、uh, OpenStreetMap X Wikidata Open Contents、uh, co-organizers. And today we are honored to have Brandon Liu as our Prime Second Day's、uh, Cost Cup's Prime Sessions. Uh, keynote speaker, and Brandon is、uh, his background in, is in GIS, and no, no, his background in the computer science, and right now he's doing mostly、uh, doing his job in GIS field, and he has a very interesting career path, and he recently is、uh, involved in, in the Map Liberal open source map projects. And he is also a long-term、uh, OpenStreetMap project、uh, developer. That、uh, not only the Map Liberal, he has his、uh, project Protos Maps that provide、uh, map solutions for those、uh, developers. And okay, still、uh, fixing the computer screen. Let's just wait for Brandon Liu for the. Okay, he's okay. Now our section will from now is、uh, nine、uh, eight. It will uh, be uh, two、uh, nine forty five. And let's welcome Brandon Liu for his speak. Is it okay? To use this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay.、Um, hi everyone. Hi conference.、Um, I'm going to give a presentation about why and how to build open source maps, and I'll also talk about a project called Proto Maps that I work on. So about me,、um, I'm originally from California. My hometown is in San Diego,、um, and I live in Taipei now.、Um, and、um, Here in this city, somewhere like my great grandparents moved to a long time ago,、um, so it feels like home to me. Um, my background is in computer science,、um, and what I'm going to be talking about is a project I started called Proto Maps in 2019, which is an open source map of the world.、Um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to work on open source full time.、Uh, it's a job for me now, so I'm a full time FOSS developer.、Um, but I'm going to start with something a little bit different, and I'm going to do some trash talk. At the beginning of the talk,、um, so who knows what this is? Raise your hand if you know what this is. I think most people、um, that, that are local to Taiwan will know what this is.、Um, so Taiwan has a very unique trash system.、Um, instead of in other countries,、uh, the trash truck comes to your house or your neighborhood.、Uh, here, you actually go to the trash truck.、Um, so. This is kind of a unique routine that people have in Taiwan,、um, but it also opens the question of when does the trash truck come, and where do you go to throw away your trash?、Uh, so, I mean, it's 2023 now,、um, and there is all kinds of tools,、uh, such as a government website,、uh, to find out at what time and at what place that trash truck will come.、Uh, so, here is like the new Taipei City website. Um, so this is something、um, that is kind of a GIS or a geographical information systems application.、Um, it has some element of location, and oftentimes it shows a map. And this is really part of our daily lives. Like almost all activities that we do outside, most people will navigate to them, or they will look at the map on their phone. Uh, this is something that even like your grandfather might use to be able to know, you know, where to take the trash out. So, how is an application like this made, especially with open source tools? So, it looks like a normal web page.、Um, it might use things like web standards. It might interact with an API. It might use a database. It might be open source, like MySQL. 
it uses display elements uh, on the browser, like HTML, CSS. It might run JavaScript in the browser. Um, and those are all things um, that we use that are open source, that are a very open platform. But for this application, what about the rest of the page? So the entire map element, is that something that is easy to create with open source tools? Um, is that something that is as simple as HTML or as CSS or JavaScript? And this is even on the conference website. So if you look for the location of the conference, it'll give you an open street map based map. But how is that made? So all of these maps on the web are very much a black box. Uh, while other parts of the web, like web standards, like JavaScript, are open platforms, there's a lot of mystery into how the map is made and how it appears on the screen, what kinds of things go onto it, and who has control over it. Is it your own map? Is it a company's map? Is it something you pay for? Is it free? So within the open web, maps are still very much a black box. Let's also talk a little bit about what are the other kinds of things you do with maps, just so we can get a high level overview. Um, sometimes when we talk about maps, we mean paper maps. They might even be historical maps, maps from the past to see how the world used to be. Uh, there's um, a great uh, site that has lots of historical maps of Taiwan. Uh, paper maps might be useful to drive to find directions. And now they might be useful for going hiking, for having maps on your phone, like a native application that you can download to use offline. to search for places, uh, to do what's called geocoding. So if I search for NTUST, where the conference is, then I'm using Apple Maps. It will find a place in the world that corresponds to that thing that I typed in. So maps uh, may have an element of geocoding of changing a string into a latitude and longitude. Uh, if I search for Taipei 101, that is a different location. If I search for Wenhualu, which is culture road in Chinese, there is 163 of those in Taiwan. So maybe it's a little bit complicated to find exactly what you mean. These are all hard problems, and there is open source projects to help you solve this problem. Maps for finding directions. If I want to navigate from here to another place, I might have a start and an end point. I might want to change which mode of travel I use, whether that is by transit or by bus or walking. Um, and there is also open source software to do this. Find me the way from point A to B. Open source software such as Valhalla uh, can help you do this kind of task um, as an open source system. But for this presentation, I really want to focus only on the map, the visual part that we see, which is back when we were like seeing the trash map, the 2D map that you can zoom in and out, that you can scroll and move around with your mouse on your phone or on your desktop. So how do you make a map if you are a front-end developer? Is it as simple as doing npm install easy web map? Is it a component that you drop in? Is there something that has to do with OpenStreetMap? So as an example, for the CostCup website, uh, this web page is a little over one megabyte, which is quite small, and it is 
takes maybe half of a second to download on your cell phone so you can find out where you need to go today. But if I wanted to use OpenStreetMap, which is an open data set and has um, a vibrant community in Taiwan, uh, it is just raw data. It is 70 gigabytes of raw data um, that is distributed under a very open license, the ODBL license. But there is a large distance between having a raw data set and having a map you can use directly on your phone as a developer or for a website. So in order to reconcile um, this difference between the raw data and what you can see on the web page, you need to introduce the concept of tiles. What a tile is, is a square piece of the world at different sizes. So you can think about it as having the first level or level zero, where a single square tile stores the entire world. And for every level after that first tile, there is four child tiles for one parent tile. So you can repeat this and you can repeat this up to 10, up to 20 times. And you can map the entire world in a lot of detail and make it so it's very quick and easy for the map to load on your phone or on your website. So for a demonstration of what that looks like, each blue square is one tile. And as I scroll or zoom the map, those tiles um, are dynamically uh, resized or changed. Now, there is open source libraries to help you with tiles on the web. Uh, there is a popular one called Leaflet, um, an open source JavaScript library. It displays images, which are called raster tiles. Um, but it is purely the part of your application that is the front end. It does not, it does not provide anything about the back end. It does not include those gigabytes of data. Uh, it is only a front end. There's also a project called Map Libre, uh, where some parts I have been contributing to, um, which is a little bit more advanced than Leaflet. It is an open source JavaScript library, a fork of another project called Mapbox GL. It displays vector tiles, which are like SVGs, which are restylable, recustomizable. But it also does not include the backend tile data. So if we wanted to make this backend of tiles, how do we make the map, the map tiles out of OpenStreetMap? Well, if we simply show every single feature in OpenStreetMap at once, and we wanted to map Taiwan, then it would look something like this. But it's not really what we expect from an application. It's not useful for finding out where you need to go to throw away your trash. It is simply a bunch of data. So as a rule for maps, you cannot show everything at once. And in fact, you need to think very carefully about what information is included at which zoom and what isn't. If the data at the top is the entire road network of your city, you might be able to what's called generalize it in one of two ways. And depending on your use case, maybe it's more clear, maybe it's more helpful to show less data than, than more data, like on the left. And it also plays into us having cultural expectations about what kinds of things should be shown on the map. For example, if we improve our map a little bit, we throw away a lot of detail and only leave the major highways, the major city names, we might have a map that looks something like this. But there's, some people would think that there's a small problem with the map. It's helpful, it, it shows generally the place of where the cities in Taiwan are. Uh, if you wanna find New Taipei City, it's right in the middle there. But some people would think that maybe the map should look like this. Um, People think that 
if it's Taipei City, it should, it's more important. It should show up uh, in higher priority than New Taipei City. Um, and there's various reasons for that. Even though a New Taipei City is bigger, it has a larger population, it has a larger area. But for some reason, um, our expectation of the world is that Taipei City is more important than New Taipei City. So any system that is creating maps uh, for human consumption will also, need to, will also need to deal with these factors. So you might think about this and say, you know, that's, it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like you could spend a lot of time and have a lot of pain building an open source map. Um, and why bother doing that? if Google Maps is free, uh, if, if Google Maps is, has done this for you, and anyone can use it for free like I do on my cell phone, um, maybe I don't see why maps might want to be open source or why anyone would need an open source map. Well, Google Maps might be free for the end user, but if you're a developer, it's definitely not free. In fact, the main business model for Google Maps is to pay per usage of the map tiles. Um, so if you have a website that has 200,000 users, um, it'll cost you um, something like 40,000 NT per month just in the, those usage fees. And there's lots of applications for, for which um, that maybe can't afford to pay for an expensive map. Um, two years ago, uh, we all had to wait in line in Taiwan to buy masks. Uh, so people started to make uh, these very cool uh, mask applications where you could find a pharmacy nearby that had stock uh, of masks. Um, and this was you know, just on the news all the time. Um, but it turns out, unless Google is donating you the resources for the API for the map, this can get very expensive. So if we want to power uh, public sector applications, if you want to power public health applications, we might need something that is you know, more, more acceptable to these use cases. Um, and thinking about localization, um, localization um, is making or crafting software to be most appropriate for one country or one language. If we want to have a map that is helpful for people that maybe can't read Chinese, we might need to change some of those labels from Chinese to English. And that's something you can do with vector tiles, but it still requires you to have the data. Uh, so Google can also show the map in different languages. But what happens if you want to have it in Korean? Or what happens if you want to have it in Taiwanese um, with those romanized names? Um, so OpenStreetMap Taiwan has done a really good job of adding this information that maps like Google do not have. Uh, what happens if you want to show it in other languages like Hakka? Or also in Formosan languages? And a lot of what makes a map a map is certain cultural norms um, or making the map biased towards one viewpoint or another. So uh, last month, I was in Kosovo for another conference. Um, so Kosovo is a country that has formal, formal, formal diplomatic relations with over 100 countries. Um, it has a provisional ISO code. It has no top-level domain. Um, it has a very interesting library that you can see at the right. But one interesting thing about Kosovo is if you look at, uh, if you look at Kosovo on Google Maps, the boundary between Kosovo and Serbia will be a dotted line. It will not be a solid line. And that's because Serbia does not recognize Kosovo as a country. So this kind of leaves open the question of who is the audience of the map? Might that audience change depending on where you're using the map? Is the person in control of the map, the developer, the developer's company, a company in Silicon Valley like Google or Apple? Is it the government? So this sort of leads in to the project I've been working on for the past few years. Um, that is now my full-time job. 
So ProtoMaps is an open source map of the world. And it is something that you can run yourself as a developer. It's the entire map in a single file on S3 or cloud storage. And it's an alternative to proprietary APIs. It uses open data sources like OSM, and it enables data sovereignty. And the audiences for this kind of map are for commercial businesses, for the public sector, and for communities or institutions that are underserved by existing map technology. So what ProtoMaps really is, is an open source ecosystem built around an open file format called PM Tiles. Um, this is a commercial company that I started to provide services around this ecosystem. Um, it is an independent company that has uh, no investors. Um, it is built around the technology of HTTP as a protocol and a feature called partial reads. So you can store the entire world of tiles in a single file and you can make an instant backend for any map application. And the purpose of doing things in this way is to make it accessible to front-end developers. So maybe you're not an expert in GIS or an expert in OpenStreetMap, but by packaging the technology in a very simple way, we can make it very simple and easy and affordable for companies, for developers, for communities to make their own maps. So a preview of how that would look. Um, I run a free service or a utility to download parts of the world. You can select your city, you can select your neighborhood. And it will pop out an instant map backend that you can host on S3. You can use it with libraries such as Leaflet, such as MapLibre. So who's using this and why are they interested? Um, one of my main focuses right now is on commercial users. Uh, so felt.com, uh, the best way to collaborate on map data in your browser. Um, they're a supporter of the open source ecosystem. They use uh, the ProtoMaps ecosystem to serve their map data, uh, to upload your own map data. For journalism, uh, so journalism, um, they often are not technology companies. Uh, they have developers, but for them, it's important to be able to simplify the deployment of data um, for, for storytelling. Uh, so sites like the Washington Post uh, use parts of the ProtoMaps ecosystem to serve their map data uh, to power their interactive websites. Uh, in the public sector, the network planning tool is a transit tool in Scotland. Um, they're using parts of ProtoMaps also to be able to display and to update uh, different kinds of transportation uh, uh, of options uh, in Scotland. So it's a public sector project. And um, this is still quite a new project in open source terms, uh, just a couple of years, but it's something that I'm lucky enough to work on full time. And there's uh, four other people that are thinking about starting their own open source projects. Um, there's things that I discovered are important. Um, some of them are obvious, um, but things that I want to emphasize um, are what makes the project sustainable. Uh, it possibly, uh, sustainability might have to do with money. Is it something that someone can make a job out of? Um, and whose job is it? Is it the people who started the company? Is it something um, that other external contributors can, um, can be added to? Um, if your project is an open source weekend project or a hobby, maybe sustainability is very easy. But what scale of project are you trying to make? Is it a one-person project, a five-person project, a 50-person project? If it is a utility project versus an art project, then you should carefully consider how your project might be used by the commercial sector. And a lot of it, but not everything, has to do with your choice of license. 
so some of the licenses that you might be familiar with are permissive licenses like the MIT license and the BSD license. And there's also a class of licenses called copyleft, uh, licenses like the GPL license, the AGPL license. And these two top categories are what we usually refer to as open source. Um, there's also some newer licenses, such as the Commons Clause license. Uh, there's other options for building free software that isn't open source, uh, like shareware. Um, and my suggestion is to think a lot about what your goals are for licensing. Is your project a library that other software uses, or is it an application? Um, if you want to do open source as a business, what is your model, and how does the license affect your business model? So a little bit about my experience. Uh, so for the ProtoMaps project, I went early on to think um, I'm using a BSD license, which is one of the most permissive licenses there is. Um, one reason why is because uh, SaaS, or software as a service, is not my primary business. And adoption um, is very aided by permissive licenses. Uh, that's valuable to the project at this time. And so why do customers care about open source? Well, it has business value to them. Uh, for all the reasons I mentioned about why we might want to make open source maps, those are also valuable to businesses. They care about transparency. They care about flexibility. Uh, in Europe, they care about privacy a lot. Um, open source is also something that creates trust in small companies who otherwise might be competing with large companies. If you are building a solution and your competitor is Google, then it to be open source is a major benefit. They can be confident that if in a couple years you're not working on the project, they can still use it because it's open source. Finally, open source benefits underserved institutions, even if they never pay you. And a lot of the benefit of making something open source is the value created for non-commercial users. If 99% of your users are never paying you, then a lot of those are still getting value. They're still able to do interesting and creative things. Um, it's just a matter of finding some part of the users that are interested commercially. And focus, I think, is something um, really important for starting an open source project. And the way I say that is that your superpower as a project creator is to be able to say no, is to be able to say no to features and be able to scope the project very carefully to your goals for the project. And I think it's important to say that um, this is different than um, being the best programmer, having the most knowledge of you know, low-level hacking, or how fast you can develop the project. One of the most important superpowers of uh, creating an open source project is being able to say no. Because pressure is going to come from companies to implement features that maybe don't really fit your vision. Those extra features are going to become a, a burden in a couple of years, you're going to need to maintain those, um, those features that you added or maybe someone added. And I think one of um, the key things so far to make ProtoMap successful um, is keeping the scope small and not adding too many features. And I'm happy to talk about anyone about my personal open source journey. Um, and as well as map data or how to make maps. Um, that's the end of my presentation. And here's some of the ways that you can find me um, on Twitter, um, GitHub, LinkedIn. Um, and if you're interested in open data or contributing or using OpenStreetMap data, there's also an OpenStreetMap Taiwan community link at the bottom. Thanks. OK, thanks, Brandon, for his sharing. And we have opened a Slido. It is coscup-gbt, or you can browse the coscup telegram to ask questions here. Anyone from the on-site have any questions about? 
Okay, then I have a personal question about Brandon. That uh, I'm curious about your uh, experience that you're a computer science uh, graduate, but now you're doing some uh, open source and GIS stuff. So how is it, uh, this experience, how do you choose this kind of, of career path? Right, so many people that work in the GIS field, they have a background in geography. Um, but I think to be able to do programming and GIS is like a superpower um, because you have access and knowledge to the tools. So I'd really highly recommend if you are an, a programmer to try out GIS. Um, it's a fun problem space. It's very full stack in that it involves databases, it involves front end coding, it involves graphics. Um, but I think that you do not need a very deep GIS background now to be able to make web maps. And that's part of my goal for this project. You had mentioned that uh, uh, some program management stuff because you will say no to those future that you are unwanted. So is there any bad experience about it that you decide to not let every uh, desire to, to come true? Right. Um, I think it's quite common. I'd say maybe one third of features that people approach me to, um, they don't really understand um, the project completely. And then what I will do is I will recommend a different project, a different open source solution um, that better fits their needs. Because in fact, while I could add the feature to my projects, they would be better served by open source solutions that already exist. Um, so my recommendation is to know what parts of your project are really unique and focus on those instead of um, focusing on accepting as many features as possible. We have a question uh, here on Slido. It actually is a test question uh, asked by myself. Uh, as an open source uh, technology solution provider, how often do we have to improve or even fix the map data? Um, how often do I improve OpenStreetMap? Open Got it. Um, when I see something that is incorrect, I try to fix it. Um, but I'm not focused on adding as much data as possible. I'm like, in, uh, in some cases, um, OpenStreetMap is quite technical. Uh, so there will be things like broken polygons that I'll try to fix. Um, one interesting thing, though, is because by default, a lot of the localization data in OSM is not visualized. So because um, with ProtoMaps, I'm trying to make it easy to localize, and you'll discover a lot of uh, incorrect information in other languages. Um, so I think as the project matures, I'll have more and more chances to be able to improve the map data. Uh, Brandon have uh, developed a Taigi map, uh, I think several years ago, that is quite interesting to uh, show the power of an uh, open stream map that can display the, those big language, but also those small local language. Yeah. Any other questions? We have the staff that can pass the mic to you. Okay, maybe I didn't understand the presentation completely, so I'm wondering um, what the scope of ProtoMaps is. Like you were saying, Open Data, uh, the Open Maps project, they provide a really large file. So does, your, uh, does the thing you're working on actually do the simplification, or? Yes, oh, okay. um, it, it's inclusive of both the conversion into tiles, as well as the ecosystem around hosting and creating those tiles. But it's, uh, the scope is only on the visual map. It is not on search or directions or mobile applications. Okay, so I have a couple questions related to that. One is, in the simplification process, you're showing it was 
every uh, subsquare is an is equally is an equal size, and then you have each level. I'm wondering if you considered one where you you don't divide perfectly evenly, but you divide based on how much data there is. So if one, one region of the graph is really sparse, there's less divisions, and you'd implement that with like a tree, so it would be logarithmic lookup rather than constant, but it might be, be faster in some other respects. Number one, and then number two, I'm wondering during the simplification, what do you look at for deciding what to make big on the main maps you're talking about that could create some problems? So for the first question, um, that is essentially how it works, um, in that um, the data format can handle sparse and dense data in different ways. Um, the internal format um, is based on run length encoding. So for very sparse areas like the ocean, there is very little data stored. However, um, because the front end expects an even distribution of square tiles, um, the layer between the front end and the back end will be those very uniform tiles. For the second question um, of um, how do I consider the simplification to work, um, what criteria are you using to evaluate uh, the simplification? Uh, the rule of thumb is to have um, a consistent visual density at each zoom level. Uh, so for example, if you are zoomed out all the way, uh, you don't want to show too much, and you want to gradually, as you zoom in, show more and more and more. Um, and this is something that is um, basically like the area of most active development right now, which is getting that right. Um, I'm, and I'm collaborating with, with other contributors to be able to make that um, as good um, as things like Apple or Google. Okay, and one final, one final question. This was in the presentation. On the, the map of Taiwan, the zoomed out view, is Taipei one of the bigger ones? Because that's what you were talked about in the presentation. This is something that we need to add um, signals for. Um, so um, that is the goal. Um, and right now we use a hand curated data set. Um, but one of the really interesting problems is to automate this. Um, however, you can't use population as a signal because New Taipei, for example, is larger in population than Taipei City. Um, one thing people do is link this with Wikidata, which we're gonna talk more about later. Um, there's this idea that um, the longer a Wikipedia article is on a place, the more important it is. So you can essentially um, make Taipei uh, more important than new Taipei because it has a longer Wikipedia article. Yeah, I'm, okay, final, final question. Yep. What, what, have you considered like looking at the density of actual map data? Like maybe a bigger city, there's more in the open source data. So if you like maybe graph that and you kind of optimized it's not a good signal in OSM. It might be okay. a good signal in other data sets. The reason why is because um, in the past, there's been a lot of automated activity on OSM. Okay. And in some places, things might be missing, like buildings. But you might have um, some county that has um, somebody automated the, the int introduction of like thousands of buildings. So you don't want to have a false positive that that area happens to have more detail. It yeah. might not actually be more important. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. <laughs> Sorry for the long question. No. Yeah, great questions. Uh, we're running out of time, so one final question. Uh, a quick question and a quick answer. How do you come up with the name of ProtoMaps? Um, for me, the number one criteria of naming a project is it needs to be easy to Google um, and find on Stack Overflow, especially for developers. Um, so I think um, you just need to think of a name that does not exist elsewhere in the world. Um, because it will make everyone's lives a lot easier than if your project is just called Atlas or Flow, for example. Um, that's my recommendation. Okay, uh, thanks, Brendan, for sharing. But at, uh, before you leave the, the table, then we have a gift from the Coast Club Program Committee, the yeah, speaker's gift for you. Okay, you may have to Stand in the middle of. Okay, so any photo or we'll just uh, thanks Brandon for his sharing. <laughs> okay, uh, our next section will start at 10 o'clock. So now is the rest time. Thank you.